Hi, I'm Rachel Lancaster, and this is the Magnificent Midlife Podcast. This is where we celebrate women in midlife and beyond. We challenge the status quo and bash those negative stereotypes about being an older woman. We're not over the hill at 40, 50, 60. We're just getting started. And the world needs us now more than ever. I'll be talking all things midlife, about issues that matter, and sharing fabulous stories of amazing women doing very cool stuff. Now's our time. I feel so honoured today to have Jessica Buchanan as my guest. Jess is a teacher, author, humanitarian, a speaker and a survivor. She is the New York Times best-selling co-author of Impossible Odds, a memoir that details her 93 days held in the desert by Somali land pirates and her dramatic rescue by US Navy SEAL Team 6. I heard Jess speak on another podcast and was so inspired that I shared about that on Instagram. She then responded and amazingly agreed to be my guest, which I still can't really believe. So Jess, it's lovely to have you here. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm excited. My first question is, I know that that you take your time to tell this story over and over, and I find that really rather amazing. It is such a gift to the world. But how do you find the strength to do that and what drives you to do it? Mm. Well, it's been about seven years since I started really telling the story since the book uh, came out. And I'll I'll be honest, we hit it really hard um, and talked about it a lot. And I was traveling all over the U.S. and Europe um, telling the story in the middle of really like processing through it as well. Plus I had, um, a brand new baby. I had a lot going on in my personal life. Um, and, and I kind of hit a wall and had to take a a couple of years off. I went back to teaching, um, try to see if life could be the same as it was before all of this happened. And it turns out it it can't, (laughs) uh, something like this, you know, any kind of traumatic event is going to change your life uh, trajectory in the course of your life forever. And there's no going back. And I think one of, hmm, I, I think it depends on how you look at it. It could sometimes feel like a lot, like a heavy weight to carry relaying the story and then that's when you take the time off and say okay I need self-care and I need to take a break and or you can look at it at other times as I think kind of a duty um to share the fact that we need these stories of survival um to help us get through other hard times or more difficult times like we're all collectively in the entire planet of earth going through a traumatic event right now and i think we really we that's why we tell stories is to be reminded of what humans are capable of surviving and that things don't last forever and that we will have the opportunity to thrive again and so um i think it's I don't know if I can't find the right word that I want to use, but I, I feel like it's a responsibility in in some some ways, even a calling to some extent. And how did you come to be working in Somalia and then get kidnapped? So I'm a teacher by profession. Um, and when I was in my middle of my university training, I fell madly in love with Africa. I traveled there um as just a volunteer and had some really life-changing events happen um, and ended up getting a student teaching position at an international school in Nairobi, Kenya to finish up my uni degree. And um, they offered me a job, so I took it because I wanted to stay in Kenya. And I loved teaching. I loved the school. I loved just the whole environment um, it was so great. It did a lot for me and my sense of adventure. I'm, you know, a very curious, adventurous person. And so it was like, yes, this is the life that I want to live. And um, I think I was like the happiest, 
probably like top five happiest times of my life is when I was just like um, new in my profession and exploring this beautiful country and meeting amazing people. And I met my husband uh, shortly after I started working um, and he's from Sweden and he was working for a Swedish NGO, non-governmental organization. And um, I think when you're in an environment like that, things are really compressed. And we were also a little bit older too. We were like in our 20s, like late 20s, and we knew what we wanted and what we didn't want. And so we fell in love and we got married and he got posted up to Somalia for another organization, Somaliland, the northern part of Somalia, for another organization that he was working for. So... We tried the long distance thing and it was just hard. Um, so I quit my teaching job and moved up to Hargeisa, Somaliland so that we could live together. And, you know, as a teacher, you're kind of like, ah, I can always find work, right? So if it's not paid work, you can at least volunteer your skill set. Um, and so that's what I started doing. I started teaching. We had a, a lot of Ethiopian refugees uh, living on our compound doing uh, like caretaking and domestic work. So I started working with their kids and then I started working with them. And then before you knew it, I was working for the UN and then I was working for my organization, uh, the Danish Demining Group as an education advisor. Cause, uh, what I found, I, and I think you'll find this a lot in the field is that you have well-meaning people who have training in project management or, you know, things like that. But there was no one working in, like a lot of these organizations that had actually real pedagogical, like educational skills and knew how to teach people to read, for instance. So I was able to take my skills and revamp their education program. And it took me all over East Africa. I was working in South Sudan and Uganda and um, Kenya and uh, eventually the southern part of Somalia, which is less much, much less safe, but we had a field office there. And um, you could say I was living my best life in terms of professionally. I know that doesn't make sense to a lot of people, but for me, I was, I just loved, loved my life. I was, I had a, this great partner and, and all this adventure and it was hard at times, but um, really loved the work that I was doing and the people I was working with. And I, in October of 2011, was um, ordered is probably a strong word, but I had to uh, go down to the southern part of Somalia for the staff training and to conduct a staff training with our local um, Somali staff. And I didn't feel good about it. My intuition was definitely screaming at me not to go. I canceled the training two times prior. And then I finally was kind of afraid I was going to lose my job. I felt a lot of outside pressure from uh, my bosses and supervisors. So I got on a UN plane, uh, flew down to Galkayo, Somalia, and made it to day three of my trip and then my colleague, a Danish uh, gentleman, and I were apprehended on the way back to our compound. It was October 25th, 2011. Um, and we were kidnapped and driven out into the desert and then subsequently held for 93 days as captives. For most of the world, I'm sure it's just unbelievable, really. It's um, very, very difficult mm. to grasp. And I know that you, you had absolutely nothing with you in the desert, did you? Mm -mm. In fact, you even your medication was restricted that you needed for your thyroid mm -hmm. issues. Um, so, what did you do to keep yourself going mm. day to day? Man, sometimes it was just minute by minute, you know. Um, mm. And then other times, I'd be able to, I'd be, be given permission to take a walk in a circle around the camp or around a tree, and I would gather my resolve and, and tell myself, uh, like I could, I had to take things in increments. Right. So I remember at one point I came back and I was at this point allowed to talk to Paul, my colleague who was in being held with me. Like I can do this for 30 more days, but after that, I'm <laughs> like, we've got to, we've got to get out of here after 30 days. I can't do this any longer. Um, it's, you know, yes, we were held out in the desert. We were not taken to a house or any kind of camp. Like, I 
always kind of laugh and say it's the most extreme camping experience I've ever had. And, <laughs> and I'm like, we're big outdoors camping people like my family and everything. So, um, so we always laugh about that, but I mean, no tarp, <laughs> <laughs> like you're out there in the elements, you're sitting under a tree, like an acacia tree all day long, you're sunburned, your lips are bleeding, your eyes are swollen shut from the dirt. And then um, we had like a small thin like mat that we sat on during the day and then we would pull it out and sleep out in the open and open fields. At night, they didn't want us sleeping under trees during the night. I don't know why. Um, and... I, I think I, you know, you go through, it's kind of like the stages of grief, you know, shock. Um, and that took probably a couple of weeks to wear off and then denial, like this is not happening to me. This is, I'm an aid worker. Uh, I'm, I'm a school teacher from Ohio for God's sake. Like things like this don't happen to girls like me, you know? Um, I was not out here like gallivanting around trying to get the next story on pirates. Like I followed security protocols. I was, you know, my organization sent me out here. Not that, you know, there's anything wrong with that, but, um, you know, I'd done everything right. Um, so then it was like, okay, well, you know, we work in the communities that the elders are going to put pressure on these pirates and, and we're going to be, we're going to be out in a week or two. And then two months goes by and you're still sitting there and you're like, okay, well that, that's not going to happen. Um, then you try to make plans to escape and realize you have no idea where you are. You're out in the middle of the desert. You can't possibly carry enough water. And even if you did try, community members are all in cahoots on this, so they're going to just turn you back over to the pirates, and then who knows what's going to happen to you then. Then you're, so you're angry, railing, you know, and I wasn't allowed to show any emotion. They would get really mad at me when I expressed any kind of emotion, so I would ask to go use the toilet, which just meant I was going behind the nearest, furthest bush, and I would just scream inside my body and inside my throat um, without making a sound and hold on to these bushes and just like crush, you know, like these bushes with my hands because I was so angry. I was so angry at, at Paul for putting me in this situation. I was angry at my organization, um, because they didn't do the things that they were supposed to do. And they pressured me to go out there. I was angry at Abdi, the man who was, uh, leading this whole group and, and, and how just, stupid I felt like he was at times and and then um then acceptance I think of like okay well this is <laughs> it doesn't matter how I ended up here why I ended up out here I'm still here and I'm gonna have to figure out how to survive this until I can get out and and so that's when um I think the there was relief in the acceptance and then that's when the real work started and I had to figure out how I was going to spend my days. So I learned how to cook. I learned how to make tea. Um, I learned how to bake bread in the sand with coals, hot coals over it. Um, I learned how to skin a goat. All these, yeah, I know, crazy things that you never think that you would ever learn how to do. Um, and then I decided to remember everything in my life that had ever happened to me. I spent hours retracing um, the memories of my life. And I started the very first memory I could think of when I was four years old and my mother took me to the movie theater for the first time. And I went through every detail, the color of her dress, what the popcorn tasted like, the scenes of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Um, and I, I really relived the hard moments of my childhood and forgave. Um, and I had been married very early in my life when I was like 20 and I went through that whole thing and, and examined what went wrong and the, the decisions that I made. And I asked for forgiveness. And, um, what I found was that I, one by one, I realized that I, I had these memories of this gorgeous life at that time. I was 32. I, I beautiful, full life, fuller than many, many people ever get. And so then I think I had to kind of get to a point where I was like, okay, you know what, if this is all I get, 
then I have had, I've had enough and it's, it's okay. Um, and then when I ran out of things to think about, I started making plans for the future because I don't know, maybe, maybe I am going to make it out of here alive. And, and then if I do, what do I want? You know, it, it was a, a very unique opportunity to really find myself, I think. Uh, I figured people quit their jobs and travel halfway around the world to go and sit in ashrams cross-legged to, you know, figure out who they are and why they are the way they are. And here, maybe this is my chance. So I was going to seize the day, if you will, and take the opportunity to, to really dig into who I was and what had made me that way. Um, and I remain very grateful for that time because now, you know, I'm a busy mom. I'm, I'm working. I've got two little kids. There's no time. <laughs> like, I'll never have the chance to do that again. So, so I guess all of that to say it really doesn't matter how crap the circumstances are. There is an opportunity for something profound to happen in the middle of it. I think that's what has hit me so much from listening to you and reading your book and everything that I've done sort of researching for our chat today. Um, it's like, it sounds ridiculous, isn't it? I just popped into my head when life gives you lemonade, mm -hmm. it really gives you lemons, you make lemonade. But out of the most awful, awful set of circumstances, you somehow manage to find the strength to create something that could help you and that could enable you to grow even. Mm -hmm. I think that's the whole point of life, right? In general, like, mm. Mm, it's, I look at it as some sort of big challenge, you know, like how am I, this is certainly yeah, a I mean, hopefully I don't have to yeah. be challenged that way again, you know, but I do, I, <laughs> I like a good challenge and, um, and I did. I was like, how am I going to come out of this better? How am I going to come out of this more resourceful, more creative, more aware? Um, because I cannot believe, I can't accept the fact that this all just happens coincidentally and that there's no reason for it. I mean, I still can't really put my finger on why it had to be as extreme as it did other than, I don't know, it just did. Um, but I, I think, you know, I'm an extremely resourceful person and I wasn't going to let this opportunity pass me by to turn it into something, like you said, like some lemonade. And I think that's, that's why we're here to figure out how to do that. I've heard you talk about how it, it took you a long time to realise that you were actually the hero of your own mm. story. It wasn't just Navy SEALs, mm. Team Six, who were the heroes, that it was you as well. Yeah. Um, and that, that was really profound for me. Mm. Yeah, I think that has been the complex part of my experience and the, the telling it afterwards um, and I am absolutely forever grateful uh, for the SEALs and the work that they do and the sacrifices that they make, um, sometimes the ultimate sacrifice, which is their life. Um, and I am so glad they got me out of there. <laughs> um, but I, I think for a while I sat in the whole damsel in distress uh, kind of character right? That here I am, this, this girl who's out in the desert and she is just waiting for somebody to come and save her. And while on one hand, yeah, that's true. The other part of the story is that, wow, I had to actually figure out how to survive until somebody was going to come and get me. And I think it took meeting some of them, uh, which I got to do about two years ago. And it was very quiet. It was very anonymous. It was um, not something that I have actually even talked to to a lot of people about the, the whole experience, but um, I think I needed to have that closure and to be able to say thank you 
to them. And I will never forget the feeling of leaving the, like the headquarters and there were several of them standing out front and we were all hugging and, and crying and I was getting ready to leave. And the last, the last seal that I hugged, I, 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 I just felt this, I don't know, this like transfer of energy in some regard of like, all they care about is that I'm okay, right? That I am living a good and happy life and that my children are happy and healthy. That That's why they do this. And I walked away from um, that encounter, that meeting with them, and I just felt like I was 10 feet tall. And it was a different feeling than I'd ever had before about myself. Um, and I think I needed to just be able to say thank you and I'll take it from here, you know? Um, and so, yeah, it dawned on me, there can be more than one hero in a story. I'm de- I'm a hero too. And, and that's been hugely freeing for me. So... Because I know when you when you finished the book, you didn't think you'd ever meet them, did you? Mm-hmm. I, I, that was the I mean, it took a got, yeah. you know, it, was... it took a long time, and it was just happenstance that it it happened. I met somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody, and they asked me if I would be interested, and I was like, "Of course, yes, please. <laughs> of course, I'm interested." Um, so you know, I think it's sensitive, and they didn't know if I. Wanted to just leave it all behind and, and not ever talk about it and think about it anymore. I mean, we wrote the book because we wanted to have an account um, for our son, who I got pregnant with right after the rescue. I know, I <laughs> cheered when I read that. I was like, nine months later, yay! <laughs> I was like, I joke that the book is called Impossible Odds, but I'm like, that was the Impossible Odds. <laughs> What are what are the chances? Um, but we also, there were so many people involved in my case from like minute five, you know, as soon as they found out I'd been taken and, and all the way up the chain of command to President Obama, who was um, the president at the time. And, and we wanted to be able to say thank you. And we knew there would be no way that we could do that in person. So... Um, that's largely why we why we wrote the book. Now I, I've heard you tell the story of of the rescue, but for the benefit of my listeners, would you mind giving us an overview of what actually happened that night? Sure. So it was January twenty fourth, two thousand twelve, and I had become extremely ill. I had gotten a urinary tract infection from just the unsanitary conditions of living outside and. Uh, dirty water that I was trying to clean with. Um, and it was going into a kidney infection. And I knew this because I'd had one before um, when I was living in Nairobi and I had to be hospitalized for about a week. So I knew the signs. I had a, a really high fever. I was in a lot of pain, so much pain. Uh, the pirates wouldn't give me any medicine. They wouldn't bring out a doctor. I mean, you know, their whole point is I'm just a commodity. They just need me alive enough to cash me in. They don't, they don't care if you're comfortable (laughs) or in pain. Um, they just need you breathing. And, um, we had had, um, what would have been my sixth proof of life call on January 16th, actually. Um, so what is that? Like a, a little over a week before. And I told our family communicator on the other end of the line that I was really sick and I didn't think I was going to make it if they didn't do something. Um, so we're three months in. I just continued to decline and getting to the point where I can't really stand up straight. I'm having to crawl to bushes to be sick. I mean, it's, it's bad. And, um, I pulled my mat out into the middle of the field, like I'd done all the other nights before. And I had a bl- one blanket. Paul and I were being kept at separate ends of the camp because we were being punished for negotiations not moving as quickly as they wanted them to. And so I was by myself on the mat, and I had 
several of the pirates sleeping close to me. They had divided them up. So half the camp, half of the guys were sleeping and guarding me. And then half the guys would guard Paul. And I um, had a routine. I didn't know until I'd spent all this time out there that I... Uh, there are two stars that come out at the same time every night and they're really big and bright and they will, you know, just kind of drop along with the, down into the horizon after about an hour. And I named one for my mother. I had lost my mother the year before. So I was, um, still very much in a grieving space and we had lost her very suddenly. Um, and I, that was a lot of, that was one of the things I really had time to work through um, so I would talk to her and, and I would give her like the accounts of my very boring day. And um, this time, I, I, I mean, it's just crazy. I think that's one of the reasons I like to tell the story too, because it's just like such a reminder to me of like what a miracle all of this is. But it was that night I, I told her, I need you to go and tell God that he needs to do something now, because if he doesn't, I'm going to, I'm going to die out here. And while I'm super excited about seeing you, <laughs> I would really like to live a little bit longer. Um, and I fell asleep. I woke up a couple hours later um, because I needed to be sick. And it's just pitch black, really black sky, black night. There, the stars had, had gone and it had clouded over. There was no moon. And I wake up and I ask to use the toilet there were nine guys on the ground that night, and everybody was completely passed out, which was really odd because there was always at least one uh, that was um, awake to keep guard because we were always, um, you know, worried we'd be attacked by another group that would maybe kidnap us or maybe it's Islamic extremists, Al-Shabaab. Um, so, but everybody was completely passed out, which was super weird. I see toilet again, no one wake up. So I grabbed my small pen light, like just this little flashlight, and I um, move to the nearest bush that I can get to, do what I need to do, and I, I come back to my mat, and I lay down, trying to go back to sleep, and I hear this scratching noise, and, and it sounds like these bugs or, or like these beetles that would come out, and they'd be like huge, these huge beetles that would come out, <laughs> and they would like get in my hair, and they would get in my blanket, um, and I just really wasn't in the mood to deal with it. <laughs> like I just didn't have the energy. I was just, you know what? Like, I'm done. I am done with all of this. I am done with all of you, you know? So I'm like, just really like just flustered and annoyed and frustrated. I'm sh trying to shake my blanket out. We'll get back down. I do this over and over. I can't see any beetles, but I can hear something coming toward me. Everybody's passed out still. So I lay back down put the blanket over my face and not 30 seconds goes by and the night just erupts into automatic gunfire. And I'm thinking, oh my God, like I'm really not going to make it out of this thing alive, am I? Like, because in my mind, I'm thinking we're going to be uh, kidnapped by another group. Um, and I'm hearing like some of the most horrific sounds, like the men that have been guarding me are standing up. Now they've got their guns they're screaming at each other in Somali. They're being hit with bullets. They're dropping to the ground, um, crying out. Um, and then suddenly somebody grabs my arms and my legs, and I, I think that I try to fight back. I've since um, been told that I didn't. I thought I was screaming, but I think I'd spent so much time screaming inside my own head and inside mm -hmm. that I, I thought I was doing these things, but I wasn't. Um, and somebody pulls a blanket off of my face and I can't really see anything. It's just like black, blackness everywhere, black sky, black night, black masks. And then I hear uh, this young man's voice and he sounds just like my baby brother. He's this young American man who, by the way, is deploying tomorrow. Um, and he knows my name and he says, Jessica, it's okay. We're the American military. We're here. Um, you're safe now. We're going to take you home. And he helps me sit up and I immediately just start shaking. I go into shock and all I can say over and over again, 
like some dummy is, you're American, you're American, like, you know, I, I just, I, I cannot wrap my brain around who these people are, how they found me, what they're doing here. Like, I, never in a million years did it ever occur to me um, that there could be a military intervention. And so one of them is, he says, okay, you know, he, I, we've been watching you the whole time. We know how sick you've been. He gives me some medicine and some water. Another one, another one wants to know where my shoes are. I can't, I can't find my shoes. I have no, I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And so he just picks me up and throws me over his shoulder. And I swear it was like a Hollywood movie. He just like starts running across this desert with me over his shoulder, like in a fireman's, you know, like position or whatever. And all I can think is like, how is this my life? Like, I once again, I'm just a school teacher from the Midwest. I don't understand how this happened to me. And he puts me down um, at some point. And my first question, of course, is where's Paul? Is he okay? Did he make it out alive? And he's sitting there and he leans over and he's like, Jessica, do you know who these guys are? Uh, nope. I don't, I have no idea what's happening here. And he's like, this is SEAL Team 6. These are the guys that got Osama Bin Laden. And I just, I don't know what to say, you know. I'm just continuously shaking at one point. Um, they ask us to lie down and because the premises aren't safe yet. So several of them lie down on top of us to guard us and protect us. And then the rest of them, I just remember laying there <clears throat> looking up and there's I don't know, maybe 10, maybe 12 guys with their backs to us and they formed a shield to protect us. And we lay like that until the helicopters come in. And um, my recollection is that I was able to walk myself onto the helicopter. And I remember crawling across the floor on my belly, getting as far away from the door as close to the wall as I could because I didn't feel safe until we were like a couple thousand feet up into the air and I was off of Somali's desert soil. And then, um, yeah, from there it was just a whirlwind. We go to an airport. They put us on another plane. Um, then we're taken to Djibouti to military base where we are hospitalized and um, taken then to Italy to another military base where it took a while before I was reunited with my husband, Eric. Um, and then I wasn't reunited with my family until probably a good week after because I um, elected to participate in the Department of Defense's hostage reintegration program. And so it was very strict and um, very, very strict and very measured in terms of when I could talk to people, who I could talk to, um, and whatnot. But I think it was the right decision. So, and then I guess you would say the rest is history. I was just trying to rebuild my life. That's when the real work began. And I've just realized that there is this amazing photograph behind you on your bookshelf. Mm -hmm of President Obama ringing your father mm -hmm. to tell your father that you are safe. Yeah, that's such a cool story. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen yeah. the picture Ooh, and there it. it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Beautiful. I love hearing that. I love hearing my dad tell that story. So he and my sister were in D.C. for meetings with the FBI and they had not gone well. Apparently one of the... <laughs> One of the guys had said to my sister, well, you know, I mean, things are moving slowly, but we haven't started getting body parts in the mail yet. So that's a good sign. <laughs> and she was just like, oh, yeah. So th things weren't going well. And um, whatever, I don't even know what day it was, you know, Tuesday, whatever, January, January 24th, going into the 25th. Um, they're at a hotel in downtown D.C., and my dad gets a call on his cell phone, and they wanted to know if it is a clear, like, secure line. 
And he says, yeah. And they say, okay, well, um, you need to keep it open for the next 45 minutes for a call. And, you know, my sister's like, oh, my God, what, like, what do you think this is? And my dad's like, well, it's either really good or it's really bad. So my sister's in the bathroom throwing up. She's, like, so stressed out. Like, I mean, the just the enormous amount of stress that this put my family through is, it's a, indescribable and I am forever grateful to them for enduring it um so yeah about 45 minutes in uh, my dad gets a phone call and the guy on the other end of the line is Barack Obama and he says John this is Barack and I just want to let you know that your daughter has been rescued successfully she's safe she's on her way to Djibouti um and I want to. I wanted to call you as a father of a of two daughters, um, and tell you, you know, we're proud of Jessica and the work that she did, and she made it, and she's strong, and um, you know, she's gonna be okay. <laughs> My dad is just like, oh, well, thank you, thank you, Mr. <laughs> President. You know, I mean, seriously, and um, that's how they found out. That I had been rescued. Wow. wow. Yeah. So not a bad way to find out, I guess. <laughs> so was Eric annoyed that he didn't get the call from the president? I think he was. I think he was fine. He was notified um, by the lead FBI agent, Matt Espenshade, who was uh, based in Nairobi and worked. Uh, I mean, he didn't sleep for 93 days. Like, yeah. he worked around the clock he's still Mm -hmm. a very good family friend I mean if it weren't for Matt I'm not sure not sure things would have turned out the way they did so yeah yeah it takes a village doesn't it (laughs) oh my goodness and what a village right I mean Mm -hmm. you you have no Mm -hmm. idea and I mean I think it's you know the government doesn't talk openly about it because, of course, it's a security issue, right? Everything has to be mm-hmm. kept really under wraps. But, I, I mean, I had no idea that military intervention was even a possibility as a civilian. I thought they just went in after military folks. You know, I'd heard there had been a, a huge, like, there had been a lot of kidnappings off the Horn of Africa around that time for about three years. Um before my kidnapping and there have been the captain Phillips um, scenario. And it was again, seal team. I'm not sure if it was seal team six, but it was Navy seals that came in and, and rescued him. And he, I think he was held for like three or four days or something on his ship. But, um, you know, you just don't think that's ever a possibility, nor do you really want it to be a possibility. I mean, as a humanitarian aid worker, it does get really complicated for me emotionally in terms of, I, you know, I worked with these people. I lived in these communities to a certain extent. Loss of life is never what you want to happen. But the bottom line is that it was a crime and there are bad people everywhere, anywhere, and this could have been anywhere. And, um... I guess it just gets gray really, really fast. So, mm. And you've talked a lot as well. Not a lot, but I've I heard you talk about the issues of surviving the survival. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Mm. It's a lot of work. And I think that this is the part we don't talk about enough because it's not sexy. <laughs> it's not exciting. It is just slogging through trying to rebuild your life. Um, in my case, I lost my career. I, there was no way I could go back to the field. Um, I had no idea what to do with myself. I had PTSD. I wasn't sleeping. I had horrible anxiety, post, um, postpartum anxiety, 
Um, we went back to Kenya and I had my son there and we lived there for about a year and, and my anxiety and depression became so bad that we had to actually leave and we relocated to the U.S. Um, it was supposed to be temporary, but here we are seven years later um, <laughs> as, as it happens. And, and um, I found it's funny because like sitting out there and doing all of the self-exploration and, and the... Um, remembering and and digging in was one part of it was it was interesting because I think it was kind of like a memorial in a way of like this is who this who I used to be because when I left I was a new person and so I've spent the last seven years trying to figure out who this new new person is you know there are lots of things about me that are the same but I knew in the first five minutes of being kidnapped and my car being taken over that my life was changed forever and nothing would ever be the same again. And, and that's true. And so, um, surviving survival is about figuring out how you're going to do the hard work, um, after the trauma and what you need and the fact that it's not linear, doesn't follow a formula, and it could probably, it'll probably take the rest of my life. And you're always the woman who was kidnapped and mm -hmm. in the desert and then rescued. Yeah. And that's always the first thing that people know about you, I guess, which must sometimes be really annoying. I don't know. I think some people are really like gobsmacked because they find out later, like after they've gotten to know me or something. And then they're like, what? You know, that, that look of like you've just sprouted an extra head is I'm very familiar with that. Um I I think that I think I tried to like become somebody else and that's why I become the old Jess and that's why I went back to teaching and really enjoyed it. But you know, I would have like my students like ask me or kids go tell their entire classes that Miss Buchanan had been have been kidnapped by pirates and and then have to go in and explain all that and it was just like oh yeah yeah I mean there is there's that so I figure why I can't really hide from it so I might as well just own it right yeah okay that makes a lot of sense yeah yeah, yeah. so here I am so <laughs> yeah and I know you have your own podcast, mm -hmm. um, which is just brilliant, and it's called We Should Talk About That, yeah. and I love it. So what's your mission with that? I'm guessing it's part of owning your story, but also communicating other stories. Yeah, well, you know, it's about having uncomfortable conversations um, in order to remove stigma around things. You know, of course, the driving force for me was the post-traumatic stress and, and um, wanting to kind of come out of the PTSD closet and, and talk about that, and especially in my immediate community. Um, but uh, my co-host Jessica Kidwell and I have conversations about, I mean, you name it. I, if, if you are thinking about it, then we would like to talk about it. So our last episode was with this brilliant, amazing woman who lives in France, actually, Tiana Dotson. She's a body liberation coach, and she talks all about being fat and why we think that's a bad thing. And um, so, you know, things like that. We talk about alcoholism and what that, you know, so it's it, it can get real hairy and real uncomfortable sometimes. But uh, we figure if we put ourselves on the chopping block, then that helps other people make me feel more comfortable about talking about these things because we need to talk about them. We absolutely do. I mean, I'm completely with you there, and I like having difficult conversations yeah. as well. I think it, the more we can do it, the better, really. Yeah, um, yeah. you just got to rip off the Band-Aid. Yeah, <laughs> rip it off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, I know you were waiting quite a while for your TEDx talk to come out. Mm. It is live now. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing. I would tell everybody there's three things everybody should do go and buy the book read the book <laughs> listen to the podcast go and watch the TEDx talk because they are all amazing um and uh TEDx talk and I've heard you talk about this is that change is your proof of life mm -hmm. and 
this is the magnificent midlife podcast and it's about midlife and it's about you know transitioning through midlife mm-hmm. and all the change that comes about with that and mm-hmm. that really strikes a chord with me that you know you talk about if we're, if we're not changing we're not living mm-hmm. um so tell yeah. me a bit more about how you've come to that concept and that idea and what it means to you now mm. I have found that it's a lot easier to figure out how to collaborate with my life than fight against it. And I love Booyah. this. Yeah, right? <laughs> I love this idea or this this practice of collaboration. I love the I, words mean a lot to me. I, I um, you know, I write every day. Uh, I'm actually working on a new idea for a children's book right now. And so I, I look up every word, every definition. I really want to know what does this word mean? And collaborating, it is figuring out how to walk hand in hand with whatever life has thrown at you. Again, it comes down to that sense of purpose. Um, I have to believe that things happen for a reason. And I may not be able to, I may not know, I may not ever know why I was kidnapped and held hostage in Somalia until I get 95 years old down the road or something. I don't know, God willing. But um, it takes so much energy to fight against things I have found. And I have a very limited amount of energy to give. And so I would like to be as efficient as possible with that energy So I would like to just figure out how to work with it. It's like aging, right? I look at my face and I'm like, oh, you know, the bags and the sags and the blah, 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 blah. I actually think I'd rather spend my energy and my time figuring out how to love those and accept those than figuring out how to make them go away. And it's all a choice. I believe we have a choice on pretty much everything. We do. So that's what that's about. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. It's amazing. I love that. Love that. I'm not saying I do it every day, but I try. It's my, mm. my, um, my, my goal is to get up in the morning and figure out how to work with whatever is coming at me. Because <laughs> it's going to come. <laughs> we, we know that very well. 2020. Hello. So. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we do, don't we? So it, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. And thank you so much. Mm. But just before we sign off, is there anything else that you really want the world to understand? Mm. Get outside. You got to get outside. My huge passion is getting my kids and my family outside. There's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothes. And uh, nature is is a healer. And I think that every, pretty much every problem, I mean, I know I sound very like clipped here, but, um, there's a reason why I was held in the desert while I was held outside because that has become a huge, significant healer for me is being out in nature and connecting, um, with her. And so I think that if you are struggling especially right now when we feel so stuck and so limited. If you have access to getting outside and filling your lungs with some some sort of air that's not inside your house or your apartment, then do it. Go take a walk. Um, get your kids outside. And I swear to God, you will feel better. <laughs> you will feel better. It's everything. It's everything. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Magnificent Midlife Podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, share it, and leave me a review wherever you're listening. It really helps me get the message out. You can find out more information about this episode in the show notes at magnificentmidlife.com. That's also where you'll find strategies, support, and resources to help make your midlife magnificent. Get clarity on how to make the most of your next chapter. Help me change the world one magnificent midlife woman at a time.